Welcome to Tips for Nonprofits, Manage Content and Collaborate in the Cloud. My name is Becky Wiegand, and I'm the Webinar Program Manager here at TechSoup. I've been with the organization for nearly seven years at this point, having prior, prior to that worked for three small nonprofits in Washington, D.C. and Oakland, California, where I was often the accidental techie and used TechSoup's donation programs and resources for my own benefit. You'll also see on the back end my colleague Ali Bazdikian, who is an interactive events and video producer here at TechSoup. She'll be here to help grab your questions, respond to any concerns, and help you with audio issues. Now for the, the experts on today's call, we are joined today by Brian Breckenridge, who is the Executive Director of Box.org. Box's charitable and philanthropic initiative. In his role, Brian oversees the company's efforts to empower nonprofits to operate efficiently and meet their missions. Prior to Box, Brian founded the nonprofit facing side of LinkedIn for Good. He's also been affiliated with uh, Salesforce Foundation as the Director of Nonprofits and Education, and so he comes with a long history of serving the nonprofit sector through philanthropic work, and he is also a board member at. Bay Area Nonprofit, uh, Bay Area Community Resources, and he um, also serves youth and families near San Francisco. So we're really glad to have him joining us today. You'll also hear from Nicole Serena Silver, who's the Founder and Executive Director for Growing Real Opportunities in the Workforce, or GROW. Uh, and her programs were developed to empower youth to take ownership of their education, careers, and futures. So she'll be talking a little bit about her experience collaborating in the cloud, sharing some tips, and what has really helped her organization as a small nonprofit benefit from cloud collaboration and helping manage their content in the cloud. We'll also hear from Tony Rodriguez, who is the Senior Director responsible for GuideStar Strategic Partnerships. Many of you may use GuideStar for your own organizational profiles. And so we're really happy to have him with us. He works with GuideStar's top corporate customers and private foundations that have nonprofit programs and initiatives and that have national scope and engage private donors, foundations, and leading corporations in increasing their charitable donations. So his work is really to try and help make nonprofits more effect effective. And they have been using Box.org for some parts of their work. He's also the Executive Committee uh, or he serves on the Executive Committee of the Board of Directors of Youth Speaks based in San Francisco, and he's an advisor to Voto Latino. So we're happy to have all of them joining us today. We are here in San Francisco. Where are you joining us from? Go ahead and let us know where you're at in the chat window. We love to see where our participants are at and what you're bringing to the table as well. And you'll have a couple of opportunities to chime in on polls throughout this event and engage with us, and we would love for you to engage with us in the chat throughout the webinar. Let us know what's working, what, how you're using the cloud. I see people chiming in from Georgia, Ohio, Michigan, Texas, Tennessee, California, Florida, all over the place. And uh, I mentioned that we're here in San Francisco because we're all in the Bay Area where we're based, including our speakers, but Tony is actually in Williamsburg, Virginia right now joining us from Box's original headquarters. So quickly looking at the agenda while you're chatting in with us, I'll do an introduction to TechSoup for those of you who aren't familiar with our programs. And we will talk about cloud content management and collaboration. We'll talk about how, to, how it's visualized, what it is, why it works for nonprofits. We'll hear some examples of, uh, from our participants, but also from Brian sharing them. We'll share some success tips on how to best use the cloud and get to the cloud if you're not there already. And we'll talk about the Box Donation Program. We'll have time for Q&A toward the end. So TechSoup Global is a nonprofit serving uh, 121 countries around the world with 63 partners. We do that in a variety of ways, including events like this and content that we create. But most of you may know us because of our product donation programs, where nonprofits are able to access uh, discounted or donated software, hardware, and services from technology partners around the world. We've been doing that since 1989 and now have served to the tune of almost $5 billion worth of products and grants to the social sector. And you can find out more about us at TechSoup.org. So with that, I would love to bring on Brian Breckenridge, who is going to take us through and invite his presenters essentially uh, to talk about how they collaborate and manage content in the cloud, share some tips on it, 
and talk a little bit about how they've used Box in particular uh, as a tool to do that. So welcome to the program, Brian. We're so glad to have you. Hey, it's a real pleasure to be on the, on the phone, and, and we really as, as an organization appreciate TechSoup and the community and support that you provide to the broader for benefit sector. So thanks, Becky, for the work that you do to share learnings like this and for your broader organization. We're huge, huge supporters of you and, and all of those that you serve. It's an honor to be on the phone call with so many great organizations out there doing important work around this world and around this country. And so I'm, I'm really pleased to, to be able to do some teaching today as well as have uh, personal and professional friends and colleagues, Tony and Nicole, sharing a lot of what, uh, what they've learned along their journey toward the cloud with, with managing content being effective in today's fast-paced and fast-moving world. So again, you, you heard uh, from Becky on who we are, so you can reference these backgrounds should you want to reach out to us. I know we're all amenable to good discussions with you over time and, and our, our people that, that have profiles out on LinkedIn, and that's always a good place to reach out to us individually. So the mission of Box.org is very much to help nonprofits or enable nonprofits to be more productive and collaborative in meeting their mission. We feel like this is the era when the knowledge and the content we have is colliding with our ability to collaborate with it and share it and store it and, and have it be secure. And so it's that intersection we're going to talk more about today. So in this brief section of our educational webinar today, we're going to show you a visualization of content management collaboration, define it, and then talk a little bit more about why it's becoming really important for nonprofits of all sizes. So I am now going to attempt to show you uh, this graphic in motion, and I may seek a little bit of support from Becky, but believe it or not, those blue and green dots that you're seeing on the screen are actually the map of all of the content, which is you know, the files within a nonprofit organization and where they travel. So the green dots that you'll see are the staff of this organization that has uh, hundreds of employees. They're a, a medium-sized organization that's, that's solving lots of poverty issues around the globe. Otherwise, we keep them anonymous. But the blue dots are the collaborators that they interact with. So consider this. The blue dots are donors, volunteers, board members, or other supportive stakeholders. The green are the staff members there. And then uh, I think you'll, you'll be fascinated uh, as we basically are visualizing what happened when they decided to move their organization from lots of servers where they have lots of their files into the use of the Box platform in this particular case, which is what I represent. But anyway, we have access to our data, so we could show it that way. But this is them using Box from day one out to their third year of use. So I'm going to click on this system here with the hope that I can bring this up for you. There's a lovely audio that associates with this, but uh, for today's sake, for the next 40 or 50 seconds, I'll just let you see the video. So again, this is data collected from a real customer that's moved their file management and collaboration into the cloud. This is their staff coming on through the first few months and year, now starting to share files externally. And so now they come in on year or day 1300, so three, three and a half years after adopting the Box platform, this is where they're collaborating. And if you give the graphic just a few more seconds, you'll see it. Uh, there's a really clever illustration here. In the middle of that blob is the ED of the organization. And that ED may be collaborating and sharing a file with the person looking after their income stream, who may very much be connecting with an external collaborator known as a corporate funder but all in one tightly managed, centrally housed repository of all of their pertinent contact, uh, content uh, with their contacts. And so I wanted to give you just that quick visualization because I think this topic of where is our knowledge, where is our content, where are the presentation assets, the recordings, the pictures, the videos, the outcome and impact research that we're doing as we manage our programs, where is the donor list, all of these files, which we would consider content for the sake of today's webinar, uh, are, are traveling around in your organization, and more and more people are moving those into more centralized places that they have a little bit more control over. 
So I ask you the question, what is flying around between your dots, your green dots, and your blue dots as your teams collaborate and as you collaborate with your external stakeholders? And we feel like the answer is that it's content. All of these file types, up to many hundreds of file types, depending on the sort of work that your organization is doing. And so we're going to have our first poll question. I'll get a little bit of help from Becky, but the question is how many locations would you say that your content or files or photos, all those sorts of things, live today? One to two, three to five, six to ten, more than ten, or you have no idea? Yep, so Becky, go ahead and click on those radio can... buttons. Yep, click on your screen and it should automatically react for you. We'll leave it open for just a few seconds here so everybody can can click those buttons and weigh in on where their content is. And and like Brian said, it's content from photos, videos, membership info, it's uh, articles or speeches, it's anything that you're creating within your organization, email drafts or you know things that you put out to your users, grant proposals, where does all of that live? Uh, maybe in a couple of locations if you're lucky, if you're one of the lucky few. Uh, and I think many of us are spread out using a lot of different systems and a lot of different methods that are not very consistent. Uh, is it mostly housed in your email inbox, which is a painful reality for a lot of us, or in spreadsheets? Um, go ahead and select those. I'll give just a couple more seconds for everyone to weigh in. So five, four, three, two, one, and we'll show results for everyone to see. So the great majority of the respondents, um, the biggest group has three to five uh, locations for all of their content. And quite a few have more than 10 or no idea, or six to 10 different, different places. So that's a lot of content and information spread out all over the place. So yeah, and I very that, much I'll appreciate you, you all back. sharing that. Thanks, Becky. So this, this is pretty telling. Uh, and, and one thing that is often most disconcerting to me, and it looks like we just had no idea to tick up one more, one more uh, sp space there, but th this, is, this is very common of organizations of all operating budget sizes. Content is so easily built now within different environments and manifest. Even an iPhone now is becoming a content generation uh, engine for organizations or cameras or Google Docs or Microsoft Word documents or, or hundreds and hundreds of other file types. And so uh, I guess it's most distressing that many of us have no idea you know, where a lot of this is housed. And certainly we all know that there's a, a good bit of throughput through our organizations with staff turnover and board turnover and volunteer turnover and so on. So I think this is, this is very representative of what our research tells us as well. So I have you ask yourself the question again, where is your content? And as Becky said, it's likely in dozens of places. Uh, likely your inbox resembles mine, especially if you're leading your organization and managing all of your different stakeholder constituencies as, as I am with Box.org. So that, uh, you know, 100,000 total there of what's in the inbox, you can bet a lot of, of pertinent and important attachments are there, uh, not to mention personal storage mechanisms. Uh, I thought this was a, a clever 1970s or 1980s Microsoft logo, just in that many of us are working on editions of Microsoft's productivity suite you know, that, are, that are many years dated. Or worst but, uh, case scenario is these massive uh, nest of wires in, the, in, this, in this server that, that uh, many of us uh, understand here on the left side of the slide. So this is likely where our content is today. Fortunately, there are great services now in the marketplace that are allowing us to centralize as the graphic on the left side of this visual portrays in one place. So now our content can live and be securely housed in one central repository that can be accessed by any device, by internal and external collaborators on a controlled basis. So in this slide, you're, you're seeing the ways that I feel those primary external constituencies are interacting with all this great content that we produce and share with them. So be it the green box of of creating our income and building capacity financially, lots of interactions there, lots of pitch proposals and grant management uh, that occurs, lots of collaboration using files and content. Same with the admin side as we're onboarding people or interacting with the board on a monthly basis with their meeting minutes, budget updates, and so on. 
on the program side, certainly don't want to leave that out. That's the primary driver of lots of collaborative file management or storage of forms or surveys or outcome or impact analysis or uh, volunteer readiness documents or maps or videos instructing our volunteers on how to do our great work. And last but not least, the place that files and content is especially um, utilized is in the communications and marketing effort of telling our story. And so the goal is for all of the content related to these stakeholders internally or externally to be housed in one secure place. Uh, and that's what the tips at the latter part of today's call are really all going to be devoted to. So we feel like this notion of cloud content management and collaboration is by definition uh, the offering of a central repository for you to start housing all of your content and then to internally and externally collaborate on that content. And I'll tell you more about definitionally what that means in a moment. But also is this notion of now accessing our content. And we all know it's very hard sometimes when we're not logged into our organization's network, if we're fortunate to have a secure network for our organization and we can't get the files, it's especially difficult to dig a file out of a board member's inbox remotely. Uh, and so that, that's where that access and mobility piece, especially if we're dispersed or have teams on the ground doing important work or raising money, uh, you know, able to access our files. So cloud content management and collaboration is enabling nonprofits to effectively manage programs and the content associated or the knowledge associated with development and content there or the ability to communicate and share the story, be it the collection of photographs from our events and from our work back to marketing volunteers or marketing staff members that then transition those to websites. That whole process can either be riddled with cost and complexity and lost files and insecure trans transmission of files, or it can be tidied up uh, significantly. And so this notion also then in the bottom left of this diagram of accessing by all stakeholders becomes especially important when you have a staff of one or a thousand and volunteers and board members numbering between one to five or 500 to 1,000. You can bet that those entities have different computers, running different browsers, running different productivity software, running different phones, be they the, the Apple variety or the Android variety, or iPads and the explosion of tablets and Google Books and all these great things that have come out onto the marketplace, the Chromebooks. And so the notion is here, we want to try and centralize this important mix of securing and centralizing our content and the collaboration on it, but also keeping that amazing ease of use out there for our board members or our volunteers or our staff who may not have the latest and the greatest um, suite of, of solutions or the latest and greatest phone uh, or the, uh, the most sophisticated technology background. So I know that's a very dense theme to cover on today's uh, call, but I really wanted to get into definite, you know, defining what is cloud content management and collaboration. And I hope that that started to at least define it a little bit and help you understand why more and more nonprofit organizations are starting to understand in this era of security scare, in this era of accessing our, our mission and doing our work 24 hours a day and needing to access our files across a broad, diverse constituency is becoming top of mind. And so I have the great pleasure now of turning it over to, to Tony from GuideStar to talk a little bit about their cloud content management and collaboration uh, history. And so with that, Tony, uh, I'll pass the, the, the mic over to you Thanks for coming on thank today. You. Thank you, Brian, and thank you, TechSoup. Um, I'm going to just spend five minutes here to introduce GuyStar for those of us who don't know it, uh, give a little background on scale, you can scale in content in the sector, and then focus on how we're using Box today uh, and the cloud in general, and then conclude with kind of the importance of, of collaboration, which can sometimes seem like a buzzword, but I'm going to try to give it a little bit more specificity. So GuideStars, for those of you who don't know us, uh, is recognized as the leading source of nonprofit information in the U.S. on nonprofits. We have about 1.5 million 501c3s, and so those are the organizations like yourselves on the phone who are for public benefit and known as nonprofits in general. We have and pursue a charitable mission to connect people, organizations, and businesses with information on the work that you guys are doing. So on your programs, your finances, 
and on the impact that you're delivering. Um, there are more than 2 million organizations in our entire database, and that would include some of the, the tax exempt associations and universities um, and other uh, business groups that are also tax exempt. All told, GuideStar is about an $11 million organization. So we consider ourselves mid-size. Uh, what's unique about GuideStar is that $9 million of our total operating budget is earned income. So we have a hybrid business model where we uh, leverage and license the database that we have aggregated and display, and that's being paid for mostly by professional philanthropy, commercial uh, applications who are also kind of engaging this sector in, in many different commercial ways. But what's most important about that mention is that GuideStar, first and foremost, is also a nonprofit. In front of you, you have a slide that kind of just it alludes to some of the demographic and more numbers uh, that, that I think are important for us to share. The importance of nonprofits in this sector um, is huge. It represents about a trillion dollars in economic activity. We also employ about 11 million people in the U.S., or 10% of the workforce. The scale of the sector is immense. And as you think about uh, the this, this sector, we also have a lot of challenges and issues, primarily being that it's a highly fragmented sector. Um, one of the things that is always startling to me that of the 1.5 million 501c3 nonprofits, 1.3 million of those are 500,000 in total operating budget and below. So it's a lot of really um, small, scrappy, um, very important nonprofits that are, are accomplishing a lot of work, typically under resource, and typically you know the staff is doing more than more than one job. In contrast, again, I'm just going to give you guys a little bit of background. Small business in the small businesses in the U.S. represent about 28 million uh, companies. So 1.3 million versus 28 million. Um, so so even though there's many of us, we are dwarfed by kind of the business sector. And when you furthermore consider that IT spending per employee in the nonprofit sector is about $2,200 per employee in comparison to the lowest sector in the, in the business economy, economy is about $4,500 per sector, you know, where you spend your money and how you spend your money in support of your mission is critically, critically important. So the key takeaway is kind of from just, just the demographics and what, what, what the sector looks like to kind of benchmark or think about yourselves is you know it's highly diverse and fragmented fragmented pardon me we are severely typically underfunded when it comes to what we spend on hardware and software you know tools to help us accomplish our mission particularly around the kind of collaborative piece that which we'll get into and so um, it, the cloud particularly box and the features that it has kind of allow you to to engage in world class infrastructure you know that's available to kind of some of the leading companies. On my next slide, we can look at GuideStar and how we're using the cloud for file share and content management. If this webinar had been, been given in January, I would probably announce that we're one of Box's newest customers. So that's how new GuideStar is to taking advantage of um, a software like Box. Now, needless to say, when, we, when I, I actually participated in the poll, when Brian asked us how many, you know, where do our files and our content live today, uh, GuideStar fell into six to ten places, and we were being conservative. Uh, I have a couple colleagues in the room with me, and we were shouting out where we, where we, we know, just the four of us know where, where we have files on. And what's, what's interesting about that is that, you know, if you're a small startup, um, you probably have have a better chance that your files exist in less places. But as you can see, even a mid-sized organization like GuideStar tends to struggle with centralization and all the, all the kind of key benefits that come with that. What I'm going to talk about today is just in our first three months of Box, kind of how we've decided to, to kind of bring this software and the cloud into GuideStar. Since we're using it across many different departments, and everybody potentially may have already been, been using another platform, the way GuideStar has started to use it is very specific application. So we're using it to uh, disperse and manage information to our board of directors. So everything from a board packet to our um, prior to our meetings to kind of financials and then to training materials that helps them 
uh, understand the work of GuideStar. We also use it within um, kind of company culture. So we have three offices at GuideStar, um, and we share files, you know, which are typically big documents um, across the company by you know, putting little folders of kind of the events that are happening in each office. And, and next, we're starting to use it within a very specific group at GuideStar. Uh, it's, it's the foundation membership group, and so we have many um, external stakeholders. Uh, foundations represent about 10% of our annual budget in terms of uh, contribution and support. And so these, these uh, kind of supporters often need plenty, plenty of information and kind of updates from us, and that's kind of the preferred way for us, we think, moving forward. Ultimately, we hope that Box uh, will be the one uh, centralized place where we can store um, kind of our files and our information. So, so that becomes, you know, that's more of a kind of a, um, a, a best practice to how to bring your a bigger organization on to leverage the tools that are made available uh, via the cloud. Um, with respect to kind of how we're using it today, the, 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 the three factors that we, when we decided to kind of uh, start adopting the cloud was ease of use was number one. Since there are other people in the company already using other platforms, you know, basically the, the, the use, uh, the look and feel, how effective it is, how quick it is to manage, how, you know, how, how easy it is to kind of modify and customize and make it look the way you want it to look is very important to us. Secondly, security. Obviously, Brian kind of put up all the benefits of all, all kind of cloud systems, particularly boxes. Security is super important. Um, and then lastly was the ability to kind of access it from any device, so whether it be laptop, um, mobile phone, Internet, or even kind of downloading the, an app that allows you to kind of just sync from your desktop uh, whenever you log in. And lastly, we appreciate it, you know, and this is um, sometimes overlooked because it almost is becoming common sense, is it ultimately saves you money. And getting back to kind of IT spend and how the sector is underfunded, you know, it's very important to kind of be as effective as you can be. So that is uh, GuideStar's first three months on Box, and we're very excited. We love the feature set. We love the way it works and how it looks and feels. Uh, my next slide, I'm going to talk to you. Just going to just um, I'm a little bit jealous of Brian's animated um, map. This is ours, which is also uh, it's not animated, but it's it's interactive. And I, this is not a live link to it, but you, what you can see here is the way GuideStar has started thinking about internal collaboration. Is um, each employee is connected to many different groups and many different initiatives and many different. Uh, objectives. And so I'm highlighted in the screenshot that you're looking at, and these are all the people that I'm working with across departments and across the company um, that ultimately will, will reflect on success uh, my, of the work that I'm responsible for within the organization. And if you were to um, look at the interactive version of this map, uh, once you selected another individual, then their kind of connections um, would also become active. And you can see on the, on the left-hand side the general kind of uh, groupings of the work that we're all engaged in internally. So internal collaboration across um, different offices, remote employees, contractors, consultants, all of that becomes very, very important uh, with respect to kind of content. Brian was talking about all devices now essentially create or generate content. And you know you multiply that by a hundred, a thousand times when you have larger organizations, when you engage ad hoc committees, when you engage volunteers, when you engage external um, stakeholders. And, and that's what my next slide kind of depicts and talks about. Um, external collaboration has become increasingly important for GuideStar. You know, the, the mission that GuideStar is trying to solve uh, by building kind of the information infrastructure uh, that will support all nonprofits, that will support all kind of leading um, measures of impact and effectiveness um, is what we're trying to build, continue to build in the sector. What you see here is how we have diagrammed information flow um, as it's generated from you know, donors all the way across to all, all the way across to kind of the professional philanthropy in the middle, GuyStar next, and then ultimately to the, its beneficiaries. All along those kind of paths, um, there's content and information being generated. Some of, the, some of that will end up in GuideStar's database. Some of that will end up in, in, in kind of these uh, content, whether they be files or images or reports. 
uh, that ultimately will will be will have to be made accessible to kind of um, our partners, our customers, our supporters, anybody who needs access to that information, and that's really where kind of Box and any sort of external community um, that that we participate in uh, it will live. So, with respect to um, kind of thought, more thoughts on collaboration. There was a recent kind of um, article in Forbes Insights that talked about the top five trends. Uh, I think they interviewed quite a few organizations and thought leaders in the space. But the top five trends that are emerging in modern philanthropy, uh, number two and number three talked about collaboration. And it's basically you know, the essence of two and three were uh, of the top five were that to solve the, the big issues of our time, poverty, the environment, access to education, access to health care, uh, employment, retraining, veteran support, to, to, to be able to solve this. No one organization, no one government, no one corporation, no one nonprofit um, is able to, going to be able to alleviate or, or, or solve any of that. It's going to really take all sectors, all organizations, many organizations to come together. And so that's where collaboration in our mind becomes critical. You know, it, it's, it's, it's vital to our work, it's vital to the sector, it's vital to your organization. On my next slide, I just, um, since I know I was throwing out a bunch of facts and figures and referencing articles, I just wanted to make sure since I think we're going to be sharing these slides at the end of the day that you guys can go uh, to, to, to this um, slide and make sure to, to kind of look up the reports and the information that I'm referencing. And ultimately, and in closing, I just want to say that you know, one of the factors that GuideStar considered, which I didn't list because it's kind of a, a soft um, criteria for us, was to really look at organizations that provide world-class software, um, but also that are committed to kind of supporting and giving back to the community, to working with nonprofits. And you know, there's many, there's many great examples, particularly in the Bay Area, but across the country. And I'll just, you know, when you think of uh, LinkedIn for Good, when you think of the Salesforce Foundation, when you think of Microsoft for Good, when you think of Adobe and Intuit, um, you know, you also have to include Box in that. You know, there, there are companies that are committed to working with nonprofits to kind of make it easy for them to engage and take advantage of the latest tools, platforms, and services. And so that always has to be, in my mind, if you're working in this sector, kind of a consideration. Uh, and obviously TechSoup makes many, many more hundreds, if not thousands of more of software and products available to you. So that concludes my remarks, Brian. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you, Tony. I really was intellectually stimulated by the graphs and the, the, the importance of collaboration that, that you guys are – the emphasis you're putting on collaboration and being conscious about how you're collaborating internally as an organization nationally and then certainly appreciate the, the zoom out on the sector broadly and, and for sharing some thoughts about how you're deploying the cloud as an organization to manage the board. So we'll turn this over now to Nicole Serena Silver, who's the executive director and founder of GrowMyFuture.org. Great spot to go learn more about their work. Nicole, I'll turn it over to you to, to educate us more about the topic uh, of today. Sure, absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. So um, Growing Real Opportunities in the Workforce is a really new organization. I founded it in 2012. Um, but we're growing really fast. Um, and GROW, it was created to fill a gap in our social system um, that is neglected, which is really understanding who we are and what we want to be doing in the world, which is super important for youth, um, especially, you know, there's a lot of programs out there that help youth get into colleges, um, but don't take the time to really look at who is that individual. And so um, that's, that's something that we feel is really important, something that, Grow aims to eventually become an international program. Um, and one of the pieces, a, a quote that I want to share, I love Nelson Mandela's quote saying, education is the most powerful weapon in which you can change the world. And at Grow, we strongly believe that we can power the future generation with self-confidence, direction, and tools that will ensure the success and happiness of the future generation. But in order for Grow to really focus on what's important, which is Grow's program, we need to have a good business structure, and it's essential to have all of our materials online. So I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about my experience of managing cloud content and how it works for Grow. Um, in order, so 
so there's, let me just um, give you an overview of what I'm going to be talking about. There's three main topics. Um, my biggest fear of using the cloud, results from adaption of the cloud, and what will help grow begin to integrate onto the cloud moving forward different apps that can be integrated. So, um, so we actually we, we have two drives that we use to ensure the backup. Um, of everything, and I, it's probably not necessary, but I'm overly cautious. So we utilize Google Drive and Box, um, and actually, surprisingly, they integrate well together. Um, and we currently have 12 volunteers, five board members that utilize our drive, and everything that we, we do from curriculum to board meeting minutes, PR documents, everything is online and and, and on the cloud. So with all of our team members and volunteers that come and go, my biggest fear around using the cloud is what would happen if all the documents were erased. I mean, oh my goodness, that would be so awful to have everything erased. And I remember one of my friends actually, um, she started a new job, and it was a horror story about her first day at work and erasing everything. Um, she erased the entire drive, and luckily she was able to get customer service support and reverted everything. So the good news is you can recover your files. And even better news is that companies are getting better about addressing this issue. And it was really quite timely where three days ago, one of my volunteers had erased one of the files. Um, and I immediately got an email from, from it was actually on Box um, that she had erased the file. I got an email from Box saying that a, a folder had been erased um, with a link to the trash can where I could go and locate the erased folder. So Daisy, who's our, who's our volunteer that erased this folder, had created a folder that, and then realized that there was a similar folder and erased it. So there was no damage done. But if there was damage, I'd be able to remedy it right away. So that was really useful and really comforting to know and reassuring. Um, and it's important to state, too, um, as that that is a feature of Box. I know in Google Drive, which we also utilize, that um, that we I, there have been files that have been erased, and it's not in the email. So I just wanted to make that clear that I'm not sure if other platforms um, such as um, uh, Google Drive um, or Dropbox, I don't know if they would necessarily email you as well. So I just wanted to make that distinction. Um, and I also wanted to share a really great tip, um, which is whoever is in charge of overseeing the management of your organization, um, make sure that they're the registered owner of the drive and owner of files related to the drive so they can receive emails like that and so that they can be in charge. And even better, if you can set it up to have it be somewhat of a generic email address, such as info at your organization's name, um, where, the, where everything, all your online platforms are registered. Um, that that would make it really easy for any kind of transition um, of ownership. So if an uh, executive director is being transitioned out and a new person is being transitioned in, it's really easy to just um, forward emails instead of it being directly, like for example, it, me, Nicole, at growmyfuture.org. Instead of it being my direct email address, it would be info at growmyfuture.org. So we could just transfer info at um, to be forwarded to the new executive director or person that's in charge. I also um, think it's important um, to, to note that not all team members have access to all the files. You can adjust access to specific documents or folders or how individuals can view specific documents. So for example, you can be an editor, a co-owner, a viewer, or a downloader of documents. Um, and that's really essential, especially you know, as you start getting bigger as an organization, as we start getting bigger, and for different types of documents, we only want certain people to be able to view them in certain ways or edit them or so on and so forth. So I'm now going to go into why I love having everything online. And simply stated, it makes life so much easier for all parties involved. So I have team members that are dispersed in different locations. And having, having everything online allows team members to not only work remotely, but to also be able to co collaborate from different remote locations. So an example of this 
Jessica, who works on curriculum development, she lives in the South Bay, and the rest of the curriculum development team lives in Berkeley. So that's about an hour's hour plus distance from one another. And with having everything online, Jessica can upload documents she's working on, and she can even make notes for other team members to view, um, which is really, really helpful that she doesn't have to be here to, to do that and to collaborate. So we've also done things such as have conference calls, and all worked on the document together while we're on the call. And time is definitely a precious commodity, especially when working in a volunteer position. So reducing commute time is a huge benefit to volunteers, and it also allows for us to source incredible talent that may not live directly close to where our headquarters are. Another um, time-saving factor is that volunteers can upload their documents directly without having to email them to me or, you know, hand them in in person. I don't have to file them for them. They can just go and directly do that. So it saves me a lot of time. Um, and, and in turn, also, new when new volunteers come on board, I don't have to send them a bunch of emails with information or give them a stack of papers for them to sort through all of you know, the documents and whatever task they're specifically coming in for. I can just send them, you know, a, a direct link to whatever is relevant to them. So everything is beautifully organized. It's all in one place for volunteers and board members to view. There's no big stacks of paper I need to sort through to find a document. I can go directly to the folder where the document is located or I can utilize a search bar to find specific documents, which makes it really, really easy. And the last piece that I kind of want to address here is, is that there's over 1,000 applications, actually, that you can integrate within cloud storage. Um, and our technical director is in the middle of integrating Asana, which is a task management system that will help us oversee what everybody is doing, and then also Hootsuite, which is a social media management tool. Um, and it's going to be wonderful to work with all of these tools under one umbrella. So having everything on the cloud, as I mentioned, like we're very new. We're only two years old, um, but we are definitely expanding. Um, I'm, I'm even talking to somebody in Ecuador and somebody in New Zealand about how much they love our program and how much they want to bring it into these different countries. Um, we're still looking at expanding nationally, but one of our values is definitely thinking outside of the box. Um, but if this is the case, if, the, if the, this collaboration takes that takes place, it's really easy having everything on the cloud. So it just it makes it so there's unlimited expansion that we can have and that people from all over can, can access documents, can access lesson plans. Um, we're, we're starting to um, put together different trainings for individuals that, that can be accessed. So it's really exciting that all of this is online and and it, it's just, it makes it so much more expansive. Um, and and I'm, I'm very thankful that I live in today's day and age where we can utilize the cloud to manage content. So I feel really honored to be able to speak to all of you, and I hope that my sharing has been of benefit. And with that, I'm now going to pass the mic back to Brian. Thank you. Thanks very much, Nicole. Very much appreciate hearing how you as an organization are expanding your important work and how you're using some of these systems uh, to do so. So my stories will be brief and then I'll get into tips. I took over, I took over the position as executive director of Box.org shortly after we launched the initiative here last May and you know, or actually came on just before it but have managed it through. Um, but in, in managing this important program that resides here at the company called Box, uh, we interact a lot with partners like TechSoup, and I just briefly wanted to have a screenshot of the types of collaboration that I've had with the TechSoup team and my team internally as we've worked hard on this important relationship uh, over the past couple of months. So on the left side of this screenshot, for those that are following along on the, on the Internet here visually, these are the different files, PowerPoints, real-time notes that are referred to as box notes in this case, kind of like uh, whiteboards, if you will, uh, and other folders, some of which are shared from this being my view out to the TechSoup team and some being viewed by the other 30 or 40 collaborators here internally uh, in my organization. 
And so on the left in this screen in these systems that, that are housing this content, you saw a screenshot from Tony and Nicole. I just wanted you to see one for me as well. Content on the left and then the collaborators and how I'm managing those on the right. And so, you know, as one example, you know, we talked about managing the content and having it in one place, but it's also important to consider how to collaborate on that. So removing this notion of sending attachments that can't be tracked around or that, that aren't dynamic. And so you can with tools like the one provided by Box, often collaborate on the file itself, as you see on the left. So on the right side of that Word document file there, which is actually a press release I'm working on in the TechSoup, you can see that we're collaborating on the right and tasking one another and keeping kind of a real-time collaboration within that document. But I can also build a folder and share that, as I have with this TechSoup collaboration webinar folder that Becky and I have been able to share for today's content. Or for this Word document press release or for today's presentation, I can go into that and share that out uh, to people with lots and lots of really specific security rules. So that, those are the, the areas of collaborating both within a document but also outside of the walls of our organizations. Another quick uh, insightful example would be recently I brought Little Kids Rock, a really cool nonprofit organization in the area of music education based in New York out to California to, to present what they do for about 600 employees of the company that, that I work for here at Fox. And that's me on the left, dressed up like Axel Rose. And I just wanted to show this because what I did, the second that I knew they wanted to come present and like do this rock and roll intro for this big meeting that we had to get the word out about their work and show a video, I said, we need to collaborate on this. We need a strategy. We need the content. And I very quickly invited, and you see there, uh, Nate and Keith and Juan Carlos and Christine and so on, I quickly invited them into a folder. Those are all employees of Little Kids Rock. So I really didn't know, but I knew that they'd been on some of the emails. And then we started immediately sharing these files and pictures we were take, taking out the event and really mapping it out and executing a really seamless uh, event in short order because of these tools. And the last insightful example will be here an organization that many of us have heard of called Kiva. Kiva uses uh, the cloud to manage content that they're capturing by taking pictures out around the world with all of the entrepreneurs that they help match up with loans uh, and donors that, that support their work through loans. And so they're out there around the world taking pictures. This is their the Kiva fellows who are doing this on a volunteer basis. They get to the Internet or they bring those into their computer and then sync those to the Internet and they get back to a major city or to the Internet. And then those automatically come back into folders which are then owned by their website team and other volunteers that then can transition those into their other, other systems. And so I just think that's a really great example of where you know, many, many assets are being captured, but they're all being fed to one place. So let's do another quick poll, and then I'll come back in on 10 minutes worth of, of tips. Uh, which example or story resonated most for you? Please go in. Was it Tony's remarks, Nicole's, or some of the quick stories that I just shared? Please do a couple of more radio buttons and click submit, and we'll uh, we'll just get a sense for which of those were were seen as as um, as most applicable or resonant for you. And don't worry, we won't hold any of this personally. We won't. <laughs> we just want to know what what uh, types of stories you want to hear. What things are most useful for you to hear about how other organizations are using different tools, or the ways that they're using tools. Um, and tips for using them to help make it more useful for you. So just a couple more seconds here, and I'll go ahead and close the poll out and share the full responses with everyone. Um, it looks like we've got about 44% really enjoyed hearing from Nicole, so thank you for sharing that, Nicole. And, um, and then Boxing Guide Star with TechSoup, um, all of that. Lots of warm fuzzies. We like it. Um, so I'll let you move forward, Brian. We've got lots of good chat going on in the uh, chat window, so we'll be answering your questions and flagging them for Q&A in just a few minutes. So stick with us. You've got it. So those examples, I think, did cross against development and programs and communication uh, and administrative functions, all again living in central places on the cloud. And know that, that Fortunately, many thousands of organizations, even if at baby steps, are starting to adopt these technologies. Uh, and the tips that, that I think are, are most important for me to pass along to you as just one provider of these types of services would be to have a pretty uh, well thought out or at minimum um, 
intentional before plan, during, and after plan of implementing a more focused central repository or cloud-based solution for your content. I would audit what your green and blue uh, dots and, and what, what does your blob, what is your blob? Audit your blob here. I did that, that video earlier for those that were on with us that showed where are, is our content? Where does it start? Who makes it in our organization? Where does it travel and where does it live securely over time? Uh, and does it stay with the organization? So just doing an audit of that I think is often really important because then you're going to know who your heavy content creators are and where your primary collaboration pathways are. And those are the baby steps and the key areas and the power users and the power processes for you as an organization that you're going to want to bring into this type of environment first and prioritize how to then go forward. I think it's also really great to create a stakeholder success project group that could be a couple of board members that are interested in, in making the, the board minutes process more streamlined, maybe somebody on the volunteer side, the staff side, but get a little group together and start brainstorming with them a little bit about their receptivity about this. And then as you're looking at the providers in the marketplace, find one that is focused on the needs of an organization, not just the, the hundreds of providers of individual storage solutions who kind of keep you in that email attachment paradigm, um, but that are focused more on the organizational needs. That, so you can have that ease of use that you need that Tony touched on, but also an ease of trust for your tech volunteer or your tech resource, especially if you have highly sensitive HIPAA type data uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the health space. So integrating with other systems, I believe as Nicole touched on, is also I think important. Your teams are going to be creating Word documents one day and Google documents one day from another browser. So find a system that's friendly with both of those. And then know that uh, picking a, a cloud content provider that understands uh, the nonprofit space is probably a plus, that provides license donations and discounts, has that great support that's available online around the clock, or is sending emails directly from their systems like was alluded to by one of our teachers today. Uh, and certainly, you know, do your best to, to, to pick providers of these solutions that would love to know about your success. and. Um, and share that success so that you as an organization are seen in the innovative light that, that I know donors are appreciative of. So during and after your move to the cloud, even if you're just picking off one process or two processes like Tony and his team are with their baby steps into the cloud for content, this slide, believe it or not, was sent to me yesterday from the ASPCA in New York City. They're doing their trainings on rolling out a cloud content management platform. In this case, they've adopted Box but they are changing, they're saying to their team that's using this, uh, hey guys, this is what's going to be changing in your world. And of course, using animals and having fun with it. But they're saying, as, a, as an organization, whether it be with shelters or law enforcement or volunteers or the program team, no more links uh, or no more files, no more big attachments. We can't track those. They, they go to email inboxes and, and uh, saved folders to die send links that are trackable and vibrant and dynamic. They're saying send less email, um, you know, no more shared drives and public drives and, and, um, and uh, individual storage mechanisms. Please share with the organization. Let's all work together in one secure place. And I just love this one slide out of about a 20-slide deck that they had. And last but not least, my tip is in building that plan, start taking some trainings provided by, by the provider that you have online. They're free and accessible. Configure the early folders or two or three or four that you'd really like for the team to pick up and run with, and then deploy this with links to the trainings in a nice paragraph or three on why you're adopting this certain platform and why that's going to be important. And I know Nicole did a good job of that after her staff and volunteers. And then continue to optimize it in later phases. So again, after you move to the cloud, lean on your vendor. Go to their support uh, uh, mechanisms. Join their communities if you see fit. I know you've got a thousand things to do but really start to share the success you have. Uh, don't be afraid to tie other functions of your organization into the, the new era of cloud content providers in this area of forms or scanning or note taking or group, group task management or donor management. Lots of those things can be tied into these modern systems. Uh, and last but not least, we'd love to, to donate Box to your organization either at box.org online or direct at TechSoup. Uh, and at box.org, we do have lots of other user stories reminiscent of what we heard today. So, Becky, with that, a few minutes to spare for q and I'll pass it back to you. Thanks very much. 
Thanks so much, Brian. And before we get to Q&A, just so people know, if they are interested in getting a donation of Box, uh, you can go to TechSoup.org slash Box, and it is available to eligible nonprofit organizations, charities, and public libraries in the United States. And you can find out more about it here. There is a 10 user license package that is available uh, for an $84 admin fee. And that's, that goes to TechSoup to help us run programs like this. And um, not just this, but all the different programs we, we run. And that's kind of based on a percentage of the retail value. So we want to make sure that you know where to get it if you do decide you want to go with this tool in particular. Um, I'm also going to show a slide that has lots of resources so that when you get the follow-up email later today, you know that there's all kinds of things in here. A lot of people asked about security, so there's articles on that. There's more details about the box donation. There's more about remote work and collaboration and how to share files. There's some that have some comparisons between different tools. And we have a guide to all of TechSoup's cloud services and products that are in our entire catalog. So for more than just, just this specific tool with Box that we are talking about today, any kind of collaboration tool, whether it is web conferencing or something else that you want to be doing, you can find a whole list of those. So I'm going to go ahead and take us into Q&A and just want to mention that I chatted out in the window that we are hosting, also with Brian, uh, a a soup chat on cloud collaboration on March 26th, immediately after the webinar that day that ends at noon Pacific time or 3 p.m. Eastern. And so after this webinar wraps up, we'll chat that link out, which I think it may have already been just chatted out. You can go there and ask any questions that we don't have time to cover today. I'm going to go ahead and do just a couple of them really quickly. Um, Martina asks, Brian, if uh, Box is HIPAA compliant. Yes, we are and have been for years. It was one of the early places that Box invested lots of resources was for that, that compliance uh, and have recently also been rated FINRA compliant. So we are as an organization that only serves kind of like the organizational uh, approach to this. Uh, those, are, those are very important to, uh, to all of our different industry areas uh, here, at, here at Box. So yes, we are. Great. Um, Daniel asked around budgeting for cloud and space, uh, and specifically around Box's donation, 100 gigabytes for $84 for 10 user licenses, and comments that that can fill up quickly. What's the range of a realistic budget? Um, personally, I don't know who fills up 100 gigabytes really quickly unless you're a big, big organization with tons of data and maybe large video files. But um, what happens if you need more than that, or if you, uh, you know, what's the expectation around cost over time? Absolutely. So what we're finding now with now thousands of nonprofits utilizing Box, that for those that want to integrate in with other systems or do want to bring in a lot of historical data or want to really open up the external collaboration to dozens or hundreds of other people, they move into what's called the Box Enterprise Edition up from the Starter Edition. And in that edition, the Business and the Enterprise Editions, both of which are up from the Starter, the storage is unlimited. Uh, and so the storage uh, being unlimited would alleviate that concern, and so then are the ability to add hundreds uh, or an unlimited number of external collaborators that you also have control over in those upgraded editions. Uh, the enterprise is at some level maybe what I'd call the Cadillac of Box, and even with that we offer a 50% discount to eligible nonprofits. And so you're going to budget for the managed named users. Uh, call it $210 per year per named managed user. Uh, and again, uh, that, wouldn't be, that fee would not be assessed annually for the external collaborators in those upgraded editions. So I know that was a mouthful, but you can just go out to box.com forward slash pricing and know that you'll get 50% off uh, of everything on that, that, that we, uh, above what we donate. Great. So the reality is we don't want you to pay retail, whether it's through TechSoup's donation program with Box or whether you're getting a discount on it directly through Box for one of those Cadillac editions. So we are pretty much out of time already, so I want to go ahead and wrap it up here. Let us know if there's something that you learned today that you're going to try and implement or a tip or tactic or some research you're going to do that you picked up during today's event. Um, let us know what you've learned, and please share this information with your network as well. And as I wrap up here, I'd like to also invite you to join us for our upcoming webinars and events. We have 
two coming up next week, one on helping patrons with e-readers. So if you are in an environment like a library or a tech center and you are helping people using e-readers, come join us for that. We'll also be talking about upgrading your Windows operating system next Thursday. So if you need to get off of an old operating system, you can learn how to do that with us next week. Then we'll be talking about donor management tools and how not to choose a donor database on the 26th. And immediately following that, you'll find that uh, soup chat that we mentioned earlier where Brian will be there to answer your questions. So if you have questions now that we didn't have time to answer, make sure to go there now, post that question, and we'll be sure to get you an answer. Thank you so much Brian, Tony, and Nicole for taking the time to share with our audience today. We really appreciate you having joined us and, and sharing your experiences with everyone. Thank you to all of our participants. Please connect with us at TechSoup Global, TechSoup.org, on our Facebook and on our Twitter. And lastly, I'd like to thank ReadyTalk for the use of their platform. Providing the use of it gives us the opportunity to present these webinars to you on a weekly basis. So you can also find out more about ReadyTalk's donation program at TechSoup.org slash ReadyTalk. We're using their ReadyTalk 500 platform to do these webinars. When you close out of here, please complete the post-event survey that pops up in your window and help us continue to improve our webinar programming. Thank you all so much. Thanks to Allie on the back end, and have a terrific afternoon. Bye-bye.